it's a pleasure to uh, to have this webinar today. It's a conversation that uh, I was uh, waiting for uh, for quite some time, so I'm very excited about uh, having uh, both um, Dr. David Hardy and Dr. Da uh, Dr. Stephen Dix uh, join us today. And maybe just a big, uh, a little bit of a of a background. Um, as you know, as we were all um, uh, learning about uh, about COVID nineteen uh, back in uh, in twenty twenty. Our community uh, of, of people with MECFS was uh, was very sensitive to, uh, to the idea that a uh, an infection, particularly a viral infection, could lead to a uh, uh, to a longer term disease, a post infection disease. This was something that uh, many uh, many in our community has uh, uh, have been experiencing before that. So um, uh, th there was a concern that COVID nineteen will lead to uh, to something that uh, that goes beyond the acute infection. And unfortunately, that's what we started to see uh, in the first few months after um, after the beginning of this global pandemic. And um, and now, uh, as we enter the third year of uh, of COVID nineteen, uh, we see uh, the larger number of people who uh, who are affected by uh, what we now call long COVID, uh, which is a um, uh, probably the newest version of a post infection disease, a post viral disease. Um, and of course, uh, it's a it's a big tragedy. But at the same time, from a uh, from a medical, from a scientific perspective, uh, this is an opportunity. And I'm, I'm I'm using this word in you know with, with a lot of hesitation. It's it's obviously uh, a part of a of a large tragedy. Um, but it does uh, create an opportunity to uh, to finally understand some of these uh, uh, processes. What happens? Uh, when uh, when a person is uh, is exposed to uh, to an infection to a viral to a virus um, uh, in this case, uh, and what happens? Uh, and one uh, and why do some people recover uh, quickly? Why do some people have a mild course of a, of a disease? And why do some people um, uh, actually develop a longer term illness that has uh, different manifestations? So it really is a unique uh, natural experiment, uh, so to speak, that uh, that gives us the opportunity. To understand many of the things that uh, we've been uh, that we've been asking for, you know, for uh, for many many uh, uh, years um, in this context, so um, we wanted to be uh, to be prepared uh, and uh, as organization be uh, a bridge to uh, to bring some of the existing knowledge, what our community uh, has learned over the years, um, and make sure that uh, this is uh, incorporated into the thinking and understanding of how to. Um, um, how to treat uh, um, long COVID, and uh, and at the same time, make sure that what we learn from uh, from treating long COVID uh, could ultimately be uh, used to um, uh, to help people who already have a post uh, a post infection disease uh, such as MECFS, uh, POTS, and other um, uh, other uh, post infection diseases. So uh, we're preparing for that. We want to do uh, the best job that we can as a um, as a group to uh, to be that bridge. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, we felt that uh, as uh, as more uh, more research is done, as more treatments uh, become available, and as, as an organization, we wanted to be prepared to uh, to participate uh, in that. And so we're delighted to have uh, David Hardy uh, join us. Um, um, as a uh, as a medical advisor, and uh, um, uh, David uh, um, really, in, in many ways, is uh, um, is a perfect person to to be part of, of creating this bridge. Uh, Dr. Hardy is an infectious disease specialist, and uh, he really has started uh, uh, his, uh, his 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 career. In the early days of the HIV/AIDS uh, um, uh, battle, and uh, it has provided care for uh, for, uh, for HIV/AIDS uh, patients, uh, has become an advocate for for that community, and uh, has continued to do uh, research, both clinical and more recently looking at other strategies to uh, to ultimately cure uh, HIV. So we're delighted to have uh, David uh, join us, and. Uh, um, We've asked, I've asked David to, uh, to reach out to, uh, uh, to his colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Dix, who uh, will be uh, uh, sharing with us uh, his more recent experience uh, coming from the, uh, the HIV uh, AIDS uh, work that he had done for, for many years as an infectious disease uh, expert 
uh, but also more recently have become heavily involved in caring for people with, uh, with long COVID. Um, and so um, it's really gonna be a very interesting conversation. I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, uh, David, uh, if you could just, uh, you know, um, uh, share why did you join uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this effort at this time? What was interesting for you? Um, and then if you would uh, uh, please introduce uh, Dr. Dix, uh, who will tell us more about his current involvement uh, in caring for long COVID uh, uh, patients, and more importantly, focusing on what treatments uh, could, be, um, uh, could be deployed and what can we learn from, from that ex experience. And then uh, I'd like to also hear from both of you about your reflections coming out of, uh, of your experience with HIV AIDS uh, for a generation, now becoming a, a more of a chronic disease. Um, yeah, what, what lessons could we learn uh, and apply them to, uh, um, uh, to our community? So uh, David, if you, if you, if you would like to uh, maybe share a few, uh, a few of your thoughts, why, why, why was it interesting for you to, uh, to join us and what is, what is your perspective on where we are? And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask you to, to introduce Dr. Dix. Thanks very much, Ovin. Um, I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to work with uh, MECFS now long COVID because this is a, a challenging um, research and at the same time, caring for patients um, situation that I know I spent a lot of time doing as an HIV provider during the early days and even through the, the recent times of, with HIV AIDS. I look at this whole syndrome of post viral illnesses. This is something that I, I know I was exposed to as a trainee during my infectious disease training uh, in the mid to late eighties. And there was, I think a lot of, <clears throat> Um, confusion and inadequacy in terms of the response from the medical community, particularly infectious disease doctors, about what a post-viral illness or, or situation in post-inflammatory illness would, would, would be like. And because we could not readily detect a virus infection during that time, um, the, the attitude towards many uh, persons coming with these complaints was not taken seriously and not really researched like it should have been. Um, my look at this now is certainly as we move into the realm of long COVID in which potentially millions of persons are going to be affected by, an, by a longer term chronic post viral illness that is very reminiscent of the same kind of complaints that persons were talking about for many years uh, with ME and with chronic fatigue syndrome, that this is really a, a continuing playing out of the same story. And I think that's something that really doesn't hearken it to become much more of an, of, of an important issue in terms of really putting in the time, the money, and the advocacy to get this under uh, more well understood in terms of a medical illness, doing the research that it takes in order to understand that, be able to come up with a very clear diagnosis uh, or at least categorization of how different manifestations of post-viral illnesses, uh, what they look like, uh, as well as start looking at therapies. You know, in the early days of HIV, there was a there was sort of a mentality that because nothing was proven, anything was worth trying. And we made some advances in some of those areas, but we also made a lot of mistakes um, <clears throat> in terms of using medications that were a bit toxic. And the thing I think that I learned the most from that was that we need to have some sort of hypothesis based upon our best knowledge and understanding of what the post-viral illnesses is caused by, those hypotheses may not turn out to always be correct, but at least uh, an initial attempts at therapy based upon some sort of scientifically based hypothesis is very important rather than simply throwing whatever uh, one may have available uh, against an illness that we are gaining some better, better insights into all the time. Let me move on now to introducing my colleague and friend, Steve Deeks. Um, you know, when I first got involved with uh, Solve ME CFS um, and really started understanding better how the, my experience with um, HIV um, in terms of understanding more about the illness, making it known to the funders in the United States and to others, uh, making it known to the pharmaceutical industry, that is what really underscored, I think, the progress that has happened in this disease. And one of the persons that I've always looked upon as being a very out of the box type of thinking and researcher 
uh, has been Steve Deeks. He's an individual who's been working on this his entire career in San Francisco. And um, although he's not trained as an infectious disease doctor, he is trained as an excellent, excellent uh, researcher. I think that's something that's very, very important to, to uh, understand is that one of the things that's gonna be very important in understanding uh, this post-viral illness syndromes is, is to really welcome all uh, interested parties into the mix in terms of researching it. Uh, and I think Steve is a great example of that. He has, he has really, uh, he has really pushed the knowledge forward in terms of understanding HIV, which has led to significant improvements uh, of treatment and has actually investigated many avenues of different sort of treatments for HIV. And I was very glad to hear that he's getting involved in the long COVID uh, study uh, uh, the recover study from the NIH, but also on his own doing research there in San Francisco at UCSF. And so I'm gonna hand it over to him now and let him tell you more about um, what his work has been like at UCSF. Steve, please. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ovid. Thank you, David. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here and um, talk about our experiences with HIV and COVID, I'm not really going to talk about so H so HIV um, infects people. You get an acute infection. Um, it's inflammatory, causes all sorts of drama and chaos and clinical issues. And we put people on antiretroviral drugs. It, it basically shuts the virus down. It goes down to essentially undetectable levels, and it persists there for for decades, forever. But during that period of time, when the HIV is under control, there is a chronic inflammatory state, low level, and lots of issues from that, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and so forth. And that's an area of investigation that our team has been focused on for, for 20 years, really. Why do people, despite having really no detectable virus anymore, develop all these health problems, okay? So that's what we did in HIV. And we go about it by bringing in people with HIV and we study them really deeply and intensively, lots of altruistic volunteers. We come up with possible mechanisms for why this is happening. And then we, we do these small clinical trials. And the clinical trials are designed to make people better, but also to understand the mechanisms. And that, that's the HIV paradigm. I'm not gonna talk about HIV drugs or anything else other than the fact that that approach bringing people in, studying them really deeply, coming up with ideas and starting small clinical trials. That's where we are for um, long COVID. That's where we should have been for ME and all the post-viral conditions had we funded it, had it gotten the attention it should have, but it did not. And, and I don't need to go into why, but, but here we are in you know 2022, I guess, yes. And as Ovid said, this is a, this, Long COVID is an opportunity, and I wouldn't be embarrassed to say that. It is an opportunity for us to really understand what's been going on with all these other related conditions going back now decades. Um, so that's my perspective. You know, in, in, in 2020, in March of 2020, when, when COVID started to, you know, basically hit big in San Francisco, we shut down our studies. And we had a, all these unemployed you know, physicians and research assistants. And so we basically decided, well, we have no idea what's going on with COVID in, in March and April, 2020, but we were pretty sure that there were gonna be some long-term issues. So we, we built a cohort, it's called the LINK cohort. And we've been following several hundred people now very rigorously for, for two and a half years. And now we're beginning to do clinical trials. So that's kind of where we are now. All right, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna go quick here because there, there's not a lot of data. There's just, but there is processes in place in terms of how we're gonna end up treating long COVID and perhaps ME and other issues. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the process right now. All right, so we know that if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, the acute infection, we have all these great therapies, right? We have vaccines, we have antivirals, we have monoclonal antibodies, we have all these drug companies developing stuff, right? Um, and and it's been an un, it's been a remarkable success, kind of like the success we had with HIV back in the '90s. You know, when there are a lot of resources and a lot of community interest and a lot of a lot of um, 
knowledge being obtained, the biomedical establishment can do great things. And they did. But they haven't done it for long COVID. And why is that? All right. And I think this applies to ME and other issues. And so it's a, these are some of the fundamental problems that we have to overcome if we're going to make progress. First of all, long COVID. It's a, there's no definition, right? The only definition out there is people have something now they didn't have before that's bothering them. Very nonspecific. It, it varies. Um, you know, if you've seen one case of long COVID, you've only seen one case. Everybody's quite different. And it waxes and wanes. Some people get better with time. Some people don't. Some people can actually get worse over time. There's no way to, there's very, very few standard definitions, the kind of stuff that clinical trialists like to measure, you know, x-rays or biomarkers or hospitalization. There's no way to sort of easily measure this stuff in a clinical trial. And therefore, drug companies are nervous because there's no clear regulatory environment for them. There's no, the FDA doesn't say, do, a, do 100 patients and show us X and then do 1,000 patients, do us Y, and then you can go out and make a lot of money. We don't have that for, for um, long COVID like we do for, for acute infection, for example. And then the stuff I'll talk about again, just at a high level, there are multiple mechanisms at play. They're probably all real. There are multiple ways by which these mechanisms, like inflammation, cause disease, like the cardiovascular stuff. And there's multiple ways, there's multiple syndromes in terms of how each people experience this, and hence there's multiple possible therapies. And that is a very chaotic situation, and it's going to be really challenging for us to sort of work through it. The only way to do it is to, is to raise a lot of money, a lot of resources, and pursue each of these pathways independently. And I think that's happening. All right. And Tony Fauci, I think, you know, he always has a way with words. And he was quite blunt when he was talking. He's not been really focused on long COVID. I'm hoping that he will in the future, now that the acute stuff is done. But he did basically hit the nail on the hammer when he said, you know, that it's the, if we come up with solid, reproducible, well acceptable endpoints in a clinical trial setting, the drug companies will, will step up and do their part. So this is really an important issue that we have to address. And I'm not going to address it here. All right. Just to let you know, so I'm, I'm part of the Recover Initiative. I think we're going to talk about this um, soon after I finish my comments in the next several minutes. Uh, in Recover, which is this NIH-sponsored, massive Manhattan-like program to sort of try to understand you know, what the mechanism of long COVID is and how to treat it, there are different therapeutic initiatives looking at drugs, looking at biologics, looking at rehabilitation, looking at mental health interventions, medical devices are a really big thing, uh, complementing alternative medicines. And, and that's great. And again, a lot of this stuff has been, been looked at in a less rigorous, less well-funded way in ME, but I'm pretty sure that we're gonna end up with a lot of rigorous assessments in long COVID. And it's my personal opinion that if we solve the long COVID riddle, a lot of these other post-viral, post-infectious syndromes will also, um, will make great progress there. All right. Why do people who acquire SARS-CoV-2 and then recover from the acute infection develop long COVID, right? And there are five buckets here. One, the acute infection causes permanent damage to something, lungs, nerves, something. Two, the acute infection doesn't actually go away. The virus persists at low levels in tissues causing ongoing harm. Three, the immune system is all screwed up because of the acute infection. You lose the capacity to regulate your immune system. You develop immune responses to your body, autoantibodies, for example, and this causes damage, or the inflammation causes damage. And then finally, either the inflammation or the autoantibodies or the infection itself results in local tissue harm within blood vessels leading to clotting, microclots, and so forth. And this causes harm. You know, these are broad buckets. They're overlapping. I personally think some of the most compelling data I've seen is that the virus causes the induction of these autoantibodies or the inflammatory response. And this results in microvascular uh, 
inflammation, clots, and damage. And that these cycles are related to the amount of activity that you're doing, which could explain post-exertional malaise and so forth. This is, you know, it could also explain some of these other findings that we're, we're seeing, including pain uh, syndrome and so forth. I kind of, I'm a bit of a holistic person in thinking that most of these things are at play, which means multiple ways to intervene, right? So for the acute infection, how are we going to intervene? Well, we, we prevent the acute infection or we treat the acute infection. Um, for a persistent infection, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to give Paxlovid or therapeutic vaccines or whatever. We're going to treat ongoing virus replication. For the inflammation part, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to block the inflammation. And there are a whole family of inflammatory drugs that are now moving into clinical trial testing for long COVID that block various potential pathways. Um, you know, and autoantibodies, how are we gonna get rid of them? Well, intravenous immunoglobulin and IVIG has got a lot of buzz in the community, it works. We're not entirely sure how this magical stuff does what it does, but it tends to work for sy syndromes in which autoantibodies are at play. You can actually get rid of the B cells that make these antibodies. So this is another very viable pathway. And then, of course, you have this issue of microvascular clotting. A lot of interest in the, in the community for anti anti things that block the, that block the clotting process, that break down clots, that filter out the clots, and so forth. So these are all viable, mechanism driven ways to go about dealing with this. Um, and let me just describe some of the data, and then we can have a discussion. A big question I always get: Does and this was a big issue about a year ago, less so now, I think. Um, but the question is, if you have long COVID or, or what the NIH calls PASS, but let's just use long COVID. If you have long COVID and you get a vaccine, will that make you better? Well, there's a lot of reasons to think that's gonna happen. And there's been some anecdotes suggesting it might happen, although there's been certainly stories it doesn't. It needs to be tested and it will be tested. And the idea here is that if, you, if your immune response doesn't, it doesn't keep the virus under control. Well, let's build up your immune response uh, with a vaccine um, and get rid of the virus. Totally plausible, might work in some people, worth trying. And how about Paxlovid? All right, this is the drug I think we're all familiar with. President Biden's just started it today, I understand. Paxlovid is a, is a drug that um, is actually kind of an HIV drug to a certain extent, but it blocks SARS-CoV-2, does pretty good work if you give it early on. And there's all sorts of anecdotes and buzz out there about people who've been suffering from long COVID for a year or so, get infected with SARS-CoV-2, reinfection, take Paxlovid, and all of a sudden, all their long COVID syndrome symptoms go away. Why they're on Paxlovid, then they stop and it comes back. We have a couple of people in our studies beautiful stories suggesting that this is happening. We, of course, have people that we know of in which doing this had no benefit. Um, so clear, this is, I think, one of the highest priorities right now uh, in the um, pending clinical trials agenda is to measure virus in people. If it's there, and we have ways to do that, give them an antiviral, probably, probably going to have to be for weeks to months to see if they get better. I'm optimistic that this will work for some people, but not for everybody. Um, you know, we, uh, I just want to just then just to show, Ovid sent me these two papers and they're really, they just came out in the last week or so and they're kind of interesting stories and they, and they, 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 they illustrate where we are in the therapeutic agenda. So, so as I said before, inflammation might be causing issues, particularly the neurocognitive stuff, brain fog, headaches, that kind of thing. Um, and we've seen a lot of biomarkers associated with those types of syndromes. And there's, just, and there's a lot, of, and people who are in the clinical settings right now are trying, they're desperate. You have, and this is a story of an individual who's really sick with really severe neurocognitive stuff going on um, and got a drug in their spinal fluid that blocked TNF, like a really critical inflammatory biomarker. And within minutes, um, I think she was um, better. And it persisted after one injection for, for four months, for four weeks. This is an anecdote. This is not something that 
by itself would lead one to say this works, but it's enough, it, it supports another growing body of evidence that for me will make this approach something that we really need to look at very carefully. And then this came out recently, and this I just wanna show, this is the first rigorous randomized clinical trial in long COVID that I'm aware of, it was just published in the last few days, and it took about 100 people with bad neurocognitive type of long COVID, bad, who'd been suffering for months, randomized them to receive hyperbaric oxygen, super high levels of oxygen on a daily basis for 40 days compared to a placebo. And they did all this brain MRI and they looked at how, and they, they actually got a remarkably, a, a, a remarkable effect. Um, their primary endpoints were meant, I mean, it was a beautiful study and it showed that actually something worked. And I actually have just, there's been some buzz about this in social media and so forth, but really it actually didn't rise up to the level of popular attention I thought it should, because I don't know of any other study in long COVID that was controlled and showed such promising effects. And it's something that makes sense. And hopefully the field will be doing a lot of these. Um, and I'll just, just end here with a list of um, stuff that, that's happening in the, in the clinics that I know that people are doing. They're usually doing it in the context of clinical care, sometimes in small clinical trials, sometimes with an FDA IND. We're gonna hear a lot about this stuff. Um, I personally totally get it when people and their physicians are so desperate to trying this stuff without really solid data. Most of the stuff is reasonably safe. Um, and any, any evidence that some of the stuff works or might not work is really gonna be informative, I think, as we, as we launch our, our clinical trials and our clinical trials agenda uh, in long COVID and other post-infectious complications. Looking at all the issues that, that happened, the neurocognitive stuff, the cardiovascular stuff, um, the pain syndromes and so forth. I'm gonna end there. David, send it back to you and we can have a good discussion. Thanks, Steve. That was a great uh, walkthrough, I think, and some great emphasis on, on treatment. I really like the, uh, the hypotheses, the mechanisms of action that you, that you proposed there from, from your paper, because I think it's that that we really need to focus in on. I think if there's one thing that I hope many of our uh, webinar participants can take away from this is that if you are one or caring or supporting one who has long COVID or ME, uh, CFS, one of the most important things I think you can do for yourself is to basically do what Dr. Deke just did, is to ask the person who's offering you treatment or as you're looking for treatment, ask what the hypothesis is. Ask why they think the treatment may work. Because without a hypothesis of why it may work, a mechanism of action, why it may work, it's just a big guess. And although we are guessing to a certain extent already, those guesses are what I would call educated guesses in that they do follow some science that uh, will hopefully end up in some, in some therapies uh, in the time. So I think, I think the important thing is, is to really, uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. And I know that there will be many questions about uh, therapies that are being tried now. But one thing I wanted, I wanted uh, Dr. Deeks to also do was to talk a little bit about the RECOVER study. Sure. Because that is, one of the things that I think we're all looking forward to, and that is some NIH funded research that will hopefully advance this field uh, in the in the not too distant future. So in um, in 2020 and early 2021, the long COVID community became began to come together and they formed these advocacy groups. Um, and it's just like HIV from the 90s. And they use the HIV road, roadmap. Um, and these advocacy groups went straight to Congress. And I actually, I actually was, I actually testified in one of the early congressional hearings about this. And it was a remarkable experience because it was actually what they said one of the only times that everybody in the on the committee attended and they all asked questions and they all asked questions about their people they knew their families their, their children who were suffering so it was it was a remarkable event and politicians they heard from this very powerful very effective lobbying community-based groups and they had their own personal experiences 
And so they they did what they should do in a bipartisan way. They 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 raised a, about 1.2, 1.3, I think about 1.2 billion dollars, um, and gave it to the NIH and told the NIH fix this. And so the NIH did something that they've not really done before, the Recover Initiative, which is a massive uh, operation, and, and it's been very controversial. And I'm not going to do any bashing on it because I think everyone's trying their best, but they decided to go about with like a Manhattan project, right? They're going to do everything. So they're building a massive cohort for, of kids, of adults, of pregnant women and doing what we've been doing for a couple of years, but at a much bigger scale, measure everything they can, MRIs and everything else, and try to figure out what people have, collect all sorts of specimens, okay? And they're doing autopsy studies. So people who die uh, with long COVID from other, something else, they're going to do these autopsy studies. And that's been informative. And they're doing medical record studies. Um, and now they're beginning to move toward doing clinical trials. So it is, it is a, a really unprecedented approach. They're, and they're funding multiple centers around the country. We're all now active. We have one in San Francisco. I don't think there's one down in LA, David, where you are, but, um, and we're actively recruiting uh, uh, people to participate in these studies. We bring them in, we spend hours with them talking about what's going on. We do MRIs and all sorts of stuff. And we collect all these biologic specimens and then we try to figure out what's going on. That's recovered. Can you tell me, can you tell a little bit about, about what the what the goals are, because in any NIH grant, it has to come up with, with the primary and this and secondary outcomes. What, what are they looking to, to, to accomplish with, with the cover? I don't think it's, it's not, um, I don't think there's any, any, I haven't, I have, if there is anything, I haven't, it's above my pay grade. I've not seen any specific things other than describe the natural history, figure out who's at risk, a lot of focus on disparities, a lot of focus on trying to, to make sure that we do it the right way. Usually we do these, like I'm guilty. We do our big studies. We always enroll typically highly educated, well-connected, often white individuals who have the resources and the time to participate. And you end up with knowledge that's not generalizable. So a lot of effort going into recruiting all the communities that are at risk, including those that are in rural areas of the country and that's actually taken a fair, that's actually partly why it's been slow, but essentially describe the natural history, figure out what it is, come up with a definition, and then come up with a mechanism and come up with the treatment. That's, that's their goal. It's, it's, it's big. Gotcha. So it sounds somewhat like something very reminiscent in HIV called the MAX. Cohort. Very, yes. Yeah. The, yeah. the multi-center AIDS cohort study, it started in 1984 for men Right, all gay men, and then in 1994 for women with HIV. And they had, in that study, a setup where they had both persons affected with HIV and those who were not. So they had a built-in control group. Uh, is anything like that happening with, uh, with Recover? Are they looking at trying to comparisons? Yes, they're, they're looking at people with, people who, who had COVID and who did not, people who had developed long COVID and who did not, right? So these, all these studies, the control groups are really challenging, All right? So, yeah. you know, a lot of, it's like a lot of things that, so people in 2020, as they were going through the pandemic, developed health problems because they're getting older, because people get health problems, because there's a pandemic. And so trying to figure out that background stuff from what's actually related specifically to the infection has been a bit challenging um, and very controversial. And honestly, it's why there's a, still a fair number of skeptics out there who say long COVID is, doesn't exist. It's just people you know, aging through a pandemic and developing what they would have done otherwise. I, I obviously don't believe that, but so these, Trying to figure out what's happening in the general population is important and a big part of recovery. And so, as you just pointed out, there some diagnostic criteria, a way that long COVID can be hopefully much more well diagnosed, or at least 
the syndrome and then perhaps sub, sub syndromes of it can be better understood to really know that everyone is, the study is really focusing on the right individuals and not ones who don't have long COVID so that there at least can be some clarification to try to at least focus the study on individuals who seem to have the same response after COVID and hopefully something similar to what ME and CFS was generated by as well. A, a, a validated, well-accepted definition of ME, post-Lyme, post-viral infections, long COVID is lacking. And honestly, I, I've been talking to Ovid about trying to sort of get an initiative going to fix this problem. We need, we need the regulators, we need the FDA, we need people like that to say, here's what we want you to measure. And then you measure it in people who get drug A or drug B or drug C and tell us to get better. We don't have that. And that's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, initially before we had good viral markers in HIV, we used right. symptomatology. We used, oh, you used to count the number, yeah, in, in HIV, we used to count the number of people who died. You give them right. AZT even, or something and you count deaths. You, you counted deaths, which was not always the greatest endpoint. And hopefully we won't ever have to do that with long COVID. But we did count symptoms too, and whether or not symptoms were actually worsening, improving, especially right. in response to some therapies. Weight, weight gain was a big one, I remember, but so was fatigue. And we had a, a challenge at trying to quantify fatigue in many of those studies, but that kind of information has been used before in clinical trials. Right, but, but, we, we, but David, David, we made no progress. In the late 80s, when you were active, before my time, we made, <laughs> No progress whatsoever until we had a viral load. That's true. Right? So That's we true. got once we had the ability in HIV to measure the amount of virus in the bloodstream, so we didn't have to ask do all this rather, you know, non-specific. We can actually measure the viral load to with precision. Once we had that, twenty drug companies. You know this. You were there. I was there. Twenty drug companies poured in. billions of dollars into the HIV, and within and within two or three years, we had we had treatment. But it was all because we had a, a biomarker, a right. viral load measurement. Yeah, and I guess what I also want to do for individuals who are listening today, who may be again affected by one of these post-viral illnesses themselves, or have friends or family who are, is to really encourage them to become a participant in some study. It may not be the recover study. There may be other studies that are similar to the one Dr. Deeks is doing at UCSF in your community. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Solve ME CFS Long COVID can help facilitate that by becoming a warehouse for where studies of Long COVID, et cetera, are going on. Because community participation is vital in order to get people involved with these studies so that representation across demographics, across socioeconomic groups, across genders is very important. I think that's one thing that is really gonna be helpful here is, is that people participate. Even if you're taking something for, for the therapy, don't feel like you cannot participate in a, in, a, in a natural history study like Recover or others. In fact, it may be an entree for getting into treatment studies earlier as well. But I think that's something that's important to take away from this webinar is that participation of those persons who are most affected is very, very important. Um, and Steve, I wanna just uh, go back to uh, something you said before about you know, uh, control groups. And um, uh, in that sense, uh, would it, how would you look at uh, including uh, people who already have an existing post-infection syndrome, whether it's you know uh, ME or or, uh, or or others, but really look at that as a uh, as a control group. Um, how how would you think about doing that? And we know that it is not part of the recover uh, study uh, goals, or as stated. But uh, you know, in your own cohort, will that give you more information about potentially how people look? You know three, four years down the road? Is that, uh, is that something that, that you think would, uh, would help? Uh, that's an interesting question. A lot of the ME experts 
particularly a lot of the neurologists that have been studying autonomic nervous system and so forth, a lot of them are now obviously getting a lot of funding from long COVID and are doing these comparative studies. Um, I've seen comparative studies of you know, some measurement in ME and some measurement in long COVID because obviously there's, the experts are, are often the same. But there's been a lot of debate on this. And a, lot of, and a lot of people said, we need to do this agnostically. We can't have any pre-existing hypothesis. Let's just focus like a laser and fix and figure out long COVID because there's so many people out there with it. Um, and then once we make progress, apply it to these other syndromes. And that's kind of where we are now. Um, I've been involved in organizing meetings on this issue. And I always want to make sure that when we talk about long COVID, we, we have experts about these post-viral syndromes at the table, presenting, sharing experiences. So that's very important. And that's why SOLVE-ME is, I think, really a critical part of the long COVID story. Um, because the disciplines have, think, but I actually think we should keep them separate study them separately, personally. I mean, they could be in the same study, but under different cohorts within the same study also. Sure. I mean, it doesn't mean that one's gonna be excluded from the other, but it's just gonna be the fact that it may be better to do it in a different way. Yeah, that's a good question, um, Ovid. I think the one thing that might be difficult is what, is what Steve just mentioned is, is that the assumption that the persons who already are diagnosed with an illness or the control group might be a little bit presumptive, meaning that that diagnosis, how is that diagnosis made? And I, and I know, and, and I'm aware of the Institute of Medicine's report from 2015, I believe it was, that actually did spend some great amount of time at, at creating criteria for MECFS. And hopefully that can serve as a, as a template for what's gonna happen with long COVID as they learn more about it. You so, want to open up for questions now? Um, yeah, and maybe uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, since you know uh, both of you were so involved, uh, uh, you know, in the HIV uh, uh, AIDS uh, uh, work uh, in the early days, uh, maybe just uh, uh, if if you could share some of your your perspectives on uh, um, uh, you know what can we learn from that experience? Of course, there's uh, uh, there's been great progress, uh, but what were what your thoughts and, uh, and particularly as it relates to uh, the community involvement, what can we as, you know, as patient uh, advocates do, uh, what worked well, what, uh, what didn't work? Um, I'd love to get your, 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 your thoughts about that. Sure, I'll jump in real quick and then let Steve speak. You know, I think the, the best word I can use in terms of advocacy that I learned from HIV was organization. The activists in HIV became very quickly both educated and, act and organized. And once they gained both those two qualities in their organizations, they could actually much more effectively do their advocacy. We have to remember that groups like ACT UP all over the United States, but particularly in the big cities, were very effective at putting pressure on the federal government, Tony Fauci especially, the pharmaceutical industry, in order to make things happen when nothing was happening for many years. And I hope that the same doesn't have to happen with long COVID or ME or CFS, but it might need to. In terms, I would just say organization and, fo and focus advocacy. Steve, what do you think? If you asked me before COVID, you know, who are, who, who, are, who are national heroes? I would have said Tony Fauci, and I would have said for one reason only. Tony got it in the late 80s and early 90s when he understood the, the power of the community advocates. And he, this is when people were throwing blood at him and locking, locking themselves outside. And he just said, come on up and sat them down and talked to them and developed this partnership between NIH leadership and the community that resulted in this remarkable progress. And so that has to happen. I don't know if that's happened in terms of the relationship between the, the long COVID advocacy groups or many of them 
um, and the NIH leadership. I know that there are a lot of representatives from various different community groups and affected people, but I haven't. I don't know to what degree that's happening yet at the NIH, like it did in the HIV. So, but the other thing the community-based advocacy groups did, besides developing this remarkable partnership with Tony Fauci, um, was direct pressure at the FDA. That was a that was a that was a bit more challenging, and that has to do with the fact that the FDA has a lot of regulatory constraints. I have not seen that happen. I don't know what kind of discussions have happened with people who regulate drug development. This to me is shocking that this is not happening. I don't think until that happens that we'll get industry engagement the way we do. But I will, I will say that the great, the thing that the advocacy groups have done and they need to continue to do is, is direct pressure at, on, on government. And it works at the federal level. It's happening at the state of California. It needs to be happening at the state levels. It needs to be happening in community levels with departments of public health. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I don't want to underestimate the influence that the communities have had so far, all of them. There are multiple different groups, multiple different, some, you know, some like this one so, focus a bit on ME, others and its relationship long code, others focused on addressing a lot of disparities that exist. There's groups that I work with that focus on HIV and long COVID. There are a lot of these different groups. They're working well together, I believe. But uh, I think you know NIH, FDA, local, state, governments, federal government. That's, that's, nice. that's yeah, that's really that's really helpful helpful guidance. So uh, we have uh, uh, time for some questions. I think questions that uh, came from uh, uh, from participants. Uh, I'll try to uh, to uh, maybe aggregate or quite a few questions. Let me uh, maybe start with. Uh, Going back to uh, where you started, uh, Steve, about the, the different uh, experimental therapeutics. Um, so you've highlighted a number that are under consideration. Uh, which do you think uh, will be most challenging to study, uh, but also will be uh, at those who would uh, most advance uh, at the field and uh, um, you know, along the, uh, the regulatory pathways? So uh, do you have your own you know, kind of uh, uh, top candidates uh, from the from the longer list that you um, uh, that you highlighted. So just to be clear, I I focus on the the root causes. Okay, and I think that the mo the easiest thing to do in terms of what causes long COVID is treat the virus early and late. That's easy. We have biomarkers now. We can measure the virus. We can treat it with antivirals. That is straightforward, easy. Should have been done hasn't been done because the companies with the antivirals have not stepped up and that's a problem. Um, so that's easy and needs to be done. And then we can deal with inflammation and some of this other stuff that's more challenging. That's totally different though than treating the symptoms, looking at what's the best way to, what's the best rehabilitation approaches. What device, there are a lot of devices out there that are, there's one that's really interesting that, that squeezes the muscles to increase blood flow. And by increasing blood flow, I forget the name of it, but it's a very fancy device. You end up getting better perfusion, you get better activity, you get better perfusion in the blood vessels and the blood vessels heal. And maybe that's what's happening with the hyperbolic oxygen study I showed. Those are less mechanistic and more let's try to improve people's symptoms. And there's a whole long list of stuff that does that, that I'm not gonna focus in on. Devices that turn on the autonomic nervous system, vagus nerve stimulator, I don't know that stuff, but that's, that's quite promising. There's one thing that's, that is kind of exciting, that's interesting, is this whole issue of breaking down microclots with anti-clotting medications. A lot of people wanna study this, a lot of people doing this on the side, lots of stuff on Twitter. I, I find that somewhat compelling. Hope to see some good good studies soon. Great. Um, uh, another question related to um, uh, to something you mentioned about about vaccine and the, the possibility. This was you said uh, was it kind of a, a, a topic about a year ago. Uh, there's one question uh, from the audience uh, about actually getting improvement. This is a person with MECFS. 
uh, who felt better after getting the COVID uh, vaccine. Hmm. And, uh, you know, is there, uh, and it sounds a bit random, they say, but uh, is there a way to uh, to think about sort of an immune response that's triggered by the uh, the vaccine that that, that somehow um, um, help the, uh, perhaps the inflammatory condition? So any thoughts on on these type of-, of, of Sure, yeah, you know, I can, it's called hand-waving, right? I can, yeah. I can, I can, if you got the COVID vaccine is a very powerful stimulus to your immune system, right? And it turns on all sorts of, and you know, that's why you're sick for days. But those inflammatory responses might be good at clearing out whatever other low level viral infection, EBV, whatever might have been causing the ME symptom. So you can, when you start mucking around with the big black box, that's the immune system, you can tell any story you want because it's so complex and so many things happening. Um, so those anecdotes are interesting and there's certainly there are reasons to think it could have happened, particularly by turning on the immune system to clear out all sorts of junk that could be causing problems. Even though the vaccine is, is engineered to work specifically against the COVID virus, it could also have other antiviral effects you're seeing because the overall stimulation of the immune system? Yeah, of course, because you're turning on, um, yeah, you're just rubbing up the, it's an inflammatory, it's like an adjuvant. If you, if you think about vaccines, it turns on TLR, X, Y, and Z, and yeah, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, Steve, there's a question that maybe, uh, uh, you know, for, for the recovery study that you, or your cohort, uh, this is a question, um, I guess, two questions. One is uh, someone who actually now got a diagnosis of MECFS that, that was triggered by, by COVID, would they qualify to, to participate? Sure. Um, and uh, if they had, and this is another question, someone who had uh, MECFS prior to COVID, but after getting COVID is now uh, experiencing uh, exacerbation of symptoms, uh, would they be able to, to participate in the study? I think that they can participate for sure and recover. I think in the clinic, the first generations of clinical trials, they might be excluded. Right? So what I've seen in terms of clinical trials, excluding people with pre-existing issues like that, um, which is unfortunate, but I, but for sure in the recover observational studies, I'm sure would be included. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and a very interesting question about, um, um, uh, you know the the, rig, the rigor of the uh, of the recover study. It sounds like you mentioned that uh, people spend hours uh, in the clinic. Uh, you know, with a very thorough investigation. Uh, that sounds really difficult for people. You know, with long COVID and uh, so yes. from our experience with MECFS, is are, are there other ways to recruit um, people who are you know debilitated by this disease uh, from you know from remote uh, locations, at home trials. How do you see the kind of evolution of clinical trials and observational clinical trials uh, in this era of COVID? Can we learn from, from that? It's a great question, very perceptive, and a problem that we didn't really think through. Um, you know, we we these these are three four hour sessions. We walk people around. We they, uh, there's exertion occurs. A lot of people with the worst long COVID don't want to participate, can't participate, and so we're not necessarily getting. The population that we need to study it's a it's one of the many criticisms of what we're doing and i'm not sure how to get around it we do we're trying to do um to encourage to allow people to do most of the most of the responses to the surveys at home on a computer but you have to have access to a computer and internet so that's also an issue it's something we've been discussing to try to how to avoid these um potential problems of not getting something that's generalizable to the people most in need. I, I think that's a good question. And we, you know, we've dealt with that in other clinical trials before where a study visit that might be three or four hours long could in fact be spread over more than one day. So that the person may have to come in more than once, but the session would be shorter. And certainly with those who have exertional fatigue, that can make a big difference. That's a, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, uh, and Steve, I, I, there was one other question, and I, I, uh, I know that uh, your site uh, has done a lot of work on uh, 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 making sure that, there's, uh, that the study is more inclusive and diverse. Um, 
could you uh, maybe share a little bit more about what kind of uh, uh, steps you're taking to uh, to do that? What have you found to be successful? Well, it, it, this is it requires a lot of resources, to be honest. So people say it's almost generic, right? People say we have to increase the number of women, the number of upper underrepresented. So that means you have to. But all the protocols and everything else is along the line, hang up a shingle and tell people to come to you. Where you need to actually hire people from those communities, train them and have them go into those communities. And, and with language that's appropriate, with media that's appropriate, with consent forms that are appropriate, right? To, not, every, not all different groups should be consented the same way. The consent forms that we use are horrendous. They're, they're cover your ass stuff. You need a, a law degree to understand what the hell's going on. It's, it's it, the, the consent process in this country is a disaster. And it's really a big issue in terms of trying to recruit people from all different communities. If people actually read this stuff, and I don't think people do, but they do, no one signs up because it, it just scares people away with all sorts of litigious type, it's, an, it's a mess. I, I can go on and on. Um, there's many, many barriers to that prevent us from accessing various different communities, but the big one is money. You need to hire people from those communities and they need to basically do the research in those communities. And that requires resources and time. And people don't wanna do it. They just wanna talk, talk, talk and say we should do X, Y, and Z and it doesn't get done because the resources aren't available. So we're doing the best that we can with the resources we have to make sure that we train the right people with the, um, and we did, we actually did, we had a study with HIV in which we were given a lot of money to do just that and we were very successful. It can be done. You know, I think you bring up a good point of it and also Steve is, but there are many examples. For example, the Y study, the study that focused only on women with HIV and those women are primarily women of color over 80% are women of color. And so in order to get them to come into the study, they had to go to the communities and have persons who look like them, women especially, and recruit them called peer navigators. And you have to, but you're right, they have to pay the peer navigators to go out and do that because no one, no one should be asked to work for free. You know, they also did that recently with a large HIV prevention trial <clears throat> called HBTN 083, in which they, they recruited over 50% of individuals under the age of 30 and who are African American. So it can happen. It can happen. But you're right. The money has to be has to come along with it. If you want those individuals, you've got to go out and get them involved by peer navigation into the community. Well, we're coming uh, to the end of our time. Uh, and uh, this was a wonderful conversation. I really wanted to, uh, to thank both of you, Dr. Dix and Dr. Hardy for, uh, for spending uh, the, the time uh, with us today. Uh, I think this is just the beginning and uh, you know, the list that you showed uh, of, uh, first, uh, Steve, is one that uh, hopefully we're now gonna be able to use as a, um, uh, a as a framework to, uh, to really look at uh, different hypotheses, different uh, specific uh, uh, drugs. And I think I'll, I'll probably just repeat what you uh, said at the beginning, which is that uh, we don't know everything that we need to know, uh, but there's enough that we know to, uh, to get started. And uh, you know, if we take that uh, mantra, which I think was the, uh, what you did in the early days of HIV AIDS, uh, hopefully we'll see uh, uh, treatments uh, that, uh, that work for people and provide solutions uh, coming out uh, sooner rather than later. So I really wanted to, uh, to, uh, to thank you and appreciate uh, your time today and look forward to, uh, to doing this again when we have more data to look at. Data, we need that. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thanks, much. Thanks, Ovid.